All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our 28th session of the Met AI Group Exchange. This week, we have Ramon Correa from ASU with us to present his research on adversarial debiasing with partial learning with medical imaging as case studies. Ramon is a PhD student in ASU's data science, analytics, and engineering program. His research interest involves studying model debiasing techniques. Previously, he completed his undergrad studies at Case Western Reserve University, majoring in biomedical engineering. Thank you, Ramon, for joining us today. So before we start, do you have any preference on how you want to take questions? Um, I'll take questions throughout. Um, just interrupt me whenever. OK, great. Yeah, so as always, let's try to make this session as interactive as possible and feel free to ask uh, questions if you have any. Without further ado, let me hand it over to Ramon. Okay. Well, thank you for the great introduction. Uh, so as, as he mentioned, I am Ramon. I work under uh, Professor Banerjee here at ASU. And the work I've been focusing on has been debiasing AI models um, using uh, adversarial debiasing. And the work I've been, this work mostly started off when I was at Emory and has now carried out over to ASU and working with both Emory and Mayo data. Yeah. So to kind of start off, so the reasoning why we, we care about AI in medicine is the, the origins of just bias in AI kind of originates in this um, really interesting paper, that this COMPASS study, where they tried to um, predict recidivism, so the risk of uh, reoccurring crime from individuals based on past history and other metadata. And one interesting thing, finding from the paper is that there was, if you looked at, let's say, the risk scores based on race, the black individuals had a much larger um, risk score compared to uh, white uh, their white counterparts. So let's say in this page, in this partic particular case, this individual only has one petty theft compared to this other individual that had domestic violence and several other serious offenses. Yet their risk scores seem to be rather contradictory, and that kind of initiated the question. Well, if these models contain any biases, um, is it possible that in the medical field there might also exist some sort of hidden biases that might be affecting patient care? And there's been several studies that have tried looking into this particular question. Um, one of them by uh, a group in the Vector Institute in Toronto, um, what they've been studying is looking at potential underdiagnosis of chest x-ray deep learning models. So what they, what they have done is that they take um, common data sets like the Chexpert data set and the Mimic data set, and they, try, they look at the classification for no finding, basically saying that a patient has no, has no disease. And they observe how, much, how frequently the false positives occur in this case in for different demographics. So looking at minority groups such as uh, women, uh, 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 black people, Asians, and Hispanics, and also looking at different age groups. And the main idea is that if the false positive rate, if the false positives are higher for minority groups, there is like an increased inaccessibility of care and there's um, we're further propagating uh, potential health inequalities and one and, and what they have found is that let's say if you compare based on gender female patients have a larger false positive rate meanwhile for with regards to age younger individuals also have a larger false positive rate and then based on race there is a considerable difference across each of the demographics. And this, only, this also carries towards to health insurance, which you, would fig, which you would assume 
doesn't have that much direct impact, but uh, it, we, we can show that there is an association between the model errors and the insurance. And one thing to be aware of is that these biases are kind of multifaceted. It's not just whether you're male or female, it's all your demographic components kind of combined together that could influence the model predictions. And here in this study, they looked at for, let's say, the individuals that are in the zero through 20 age group, what's a breakdown amongst them? What's the false positive rates for male versus females in that age group and so forth. And this kind of started off the question in this group uh, at Emory when led by Professor Dichoya and Professor Banerjee, which was, uh, can we like start looking at to what might be causing these potential biases? And one of the things that we identified was that the models could really easily identify race looking at medical images. And this isn't just like chest x-rays, on mammography, on CT, and also on MRI to some degree, it was relatively easy to just train a dense net to predict race. And the main concern is that are the models utilizing these features then to do some task-related prediction? So predict your disease by learning some confounding related to race. And our goal in the current ongoing research project is to build models that regardless of your demographic attribute, at least for disease, they should not impact your final outcome or final prediction. And one of the things we've explored and many other groups have also explored is building models with more diverse data sets. Uh, there's been some several studies that have shown that if you have a more balanced data set, let's say a 50-50 distribution of males versus females, that you can train a model that is very, that is much better than a model that just has predominantly male patients. And that can help out in overall performance, but does it actually, let's say, make a model fair? Because again, we're questioning whether it will, for all patients equally, uh, treat them better, um, treat them fairly. And we had tested this same idea at Emory, and we had shown that, oh, if we have a balanced model, we can get slightly better performance compared to having a um, model that's biased with regards to demographics. So by balanced and biased, I mean balanced, having a 50-50 split in patient distribution, biased meaning that it's predominantly uh, white in this case, and minority black. Meanwhile, the test sets were still 50-50 distribution. And you can see that the balanced data set on Emory performed much better than the, uh, well, only slightly better. Um, but even if they have comparable performance, is it still actually fair? And so the question for fairness is how do we measure it? And for the sake of this study, the way we're going to measure a fair model is by looking at the true positive rate disparities. And by disparity is that we will be looking at the ratio of the true positive rate of one demographic divided by the true positive rate of another demographic, in this case being the majority group. And the idea is that we should not be that the performance for minority groups shouldn't be that much different than the uh, majority group. And in this case, the threshold is what we refer to as the 80% rule, which is in the 1.2 to 0.8 range. So if your model's TPR disparity is within those ranges, then we can say that this is a fair model. Or if we make progress towards being within those bounds, we've made a fairer model. And the one thing that we found is that in our Emory model, where we had this, these balanced data sets and then also tested on the unbalanced data set, that the disparities can still occur. So over here in this chart for the Chexpert labels, 
we see that both the balance and the unbalanced models, there are several categories where there's still some significant disparities occurring. And the patterns are still kind of similar. So we kind of would say that the biases are not necessarily just removed by having balanced data sets. Like we would need to, there's something more occurring in the training process that we would need to improve in order to achieve complete uh, fairness. And the way we would target, uh, try to improve on this fairness is try to unlearn features that might be related to race. So previously from the paper that we had done on detecting race, uh, we argued that perhaps it would be better to train a model that is agnostic to demographic features, such as race or age or gender. And to explain how adver using adversarial devising would work, here's like this toy example where you're doing the traditional MNIST uh, in digit detection task, but the data set has been biased with some artificial colors, where in training, the zeros are red and the ones are blue. And during training, and since you're feeding it, feeding the three channels towards the network, it might learn to correlate the color with the number, accidentally biasing the model, leading to a suboptimal classifier, as we can see here in this slide. And with adversarial debiasing, what we would like to do is by using this uh, correlated feature. So in the case of the MNIS example color as our adversarial task, and in the case of medical images, um, patient demographics, we would like to keep the model, prevent the model from learning to use those features. And then the way that that works is by using this domain component, we train the model, whenever the model tries to predict, let's say color, we penalize it for predicting color by using this gradient reversal layer, where instead of minimizing the loss, it's actually maximizing the loss, but we're still minimizing the overall task loss. And in this case, the features should ideally be uh, agnostic to agnostic to that particular domain or uh, adversarial task. In this case, being color. Um, the one problem with this uh, approach is that since those features can be correlated, let's say they have some sort of relationship occurring. Uh, we usually see a large decrease in performance. And even though the model might be fair, uh, there's this study over here where they applied it for image detection tasks. And regardless of how you did your adversarial training, uh, adversarial debiasing, the model usually, the model's performance was usually much lower than the biased model's original performance. And let's say for the field of medicine, we would prefer to have the best performance possible. And the idea of my project that I've been working on is that perhaps instead of training the entire, uh, debiasing the entire network, the entire backbone of the network, we would only retrain certain components of the network such that only we we do not lose that much performance during our debiasing step. And the question is then, well, how do I identify what features to debias? Or I mean, what which layers do I retrain? And the way we would identify these layers is through an ablation study, where you take the original network that we trained for a particular task, and we try to observe which areas have a greater impact on predicting uh, the adversarial task compared to the main task. So um, for those that aren't aware how ablation studies work, ablation is for every convolutional layer, 
you observe all the series of filters and you identify using just the Euclidean distance, a group of filters that are correlated and you set them to zero. So it's almost like you removed, removed them from the network and they, they, their features are no longer used by the network and it sh they should impact the model's performance. So in this case, we're trying in this example, it's trying to detect signs. And there's a pretty good filter over here that looks like it's highlighting the 60. And so if we removed that filter, it can no longer detect the number in a way. And that's how we would identify that this area of the network is focusing on one task. So for the sake of our example and for our study, we will be seeing how each layer by ablating the filters, uh, we can measure if ablating that filter influences more the task, the task prediction or the adversarial task prediction. And in, by observing those features, we can then identify what parts of the model we can retrain. Uh, so if there's no question so far, I'm gonna, I will move on to the discussion of applying the model per se. And the model that we, the model, the study design that we did is that we went with two data sets from memory that we had curated that we believe had some correlations with race that we could potentially improve some performance by utilizing this technique. And the first one is mammography, where the prediction of breast density could be correlated with race because there's subtle racial differences in, the dis in breast densities. Meanwhile, for chest x-rays, uh, from the papers that I previously discussed, we've already observed that there is some biases, biases occurring with regards to race. We might not know what they are, but the task here is since a model can easily learn race, we can try to penalize the model from learning race related features and obtain more uh, race agnostic uh, predictions. So we will start off with the Emory data set, Emory mammography data set, which was this data set that we had curated about 150,000 patients that contains basically everything that we needed from BIRAT score. So that's a risk score assigned during, uh, uh, during initial mammography screening, the tissue density score that we can see over here, and then the patients in demographic. And the one interesting thing to note that I previously mentioned, in this case, so in this data set, um, there is a, a statistically significant difference in um, breast density for Asian women who tend to have a, a higher breast density and for African-American women uh, have a much lower uh, breast density score. And here is just the data that we'll be working with. So uh, using a, a subset of the data, 27,000 images for training, 3,000 images for testing, we can see that we have a near 50-50 split for um, black and white patients. And then for Asian patients, we have a really small cohort, but ideally this might help us out with the debiasing because ideally if the model is truly race agnostic, it, we should perform equally well for all of for all the groups. And here is what I was referring to about the different distributions. Uh, we can see here in the tissue density distribution, counts that the Asian demographic is mostly skewed towards the right with little to no patients having a breast density score of one. And then with black patients and uh, white patients having equal splits mostly with uh, African-American patients not having many patients in the category four. And what we did was we trained this very basic uh, in uh, ResNet model 
we did the traditional hyperparameter tuning steps. And oh, one important fact is that we only trained on the MLO view of images just to maintain consistency across the entire process. And from that train model, we obtained like pretty good performance on the testing set. Really good um, training uh, density prediction model wasn't that difficult. But we wanted to see how those features actually, um, this prediction task correlated with race to identify any potential disparities. So what we did is that that same ResNet model had a race prediction branch added towards it, where I froze the backbone, and then on that pred trained uh, prediction uh, branch to predict race and see how well it could use the breast density features to predict race. And the outcome was that it's not perfect. It's not the best model, but it's also much better than random. As we can see here in the AUCs, um, for the Asian demographic, um, the model wasn't, there wasn't any balancing of the classes. So we have very somewhat low precision for the Asian demographic, but it was a very, it was very easy for the model just to learn a pretty good scoring just using the breast density features in general. And now I move on to trying to remove the race related features. And the way that we will move, remove the race related features is using a two-step process, where in the first step, we try to minimize the loss for predicting both tissue density and the adversarial task, which in this case is race. Then in the same forward step, we, uh, not in the same sense, we do another forward step where we penalize the model for any demographic prediction. Uh, oh, somebody just joined. Anyway, so we do a, another forward step where we only get the loss for predicting the adversarial task, which is demographics. And in the back propagation step, we reverse the gradients doing a gradient reversal layer. And what that gradient reversal layer does is that, well, traditionally we're going in the direction where we're minimizing the loss. Since we reverse the gradient, we're now going in the opposite direction. And that should ideally make the model uh, worse at predicting the demographic information, making the backbone features uh, less useful for the demographic prediction. And in our experiment, um, the only difference is between the partial devising and the partial step and the traditional devising is that, again, well, for the partial, I'm only retraining a subset of the network. And here we can see the results for the breast density in prediction. And looking at the baseline model versus the traditional devising approach, we see the expected behavior of decrease in performance, overall performance. Then for the partial debiasing, we still see a decrease in performance, but it is not as severe as the baseline model, um, which is um, one of our main goals was to prevent the performance from dipping severely. Here we can, we have some reassurance that the impact on performance isn't, isn't as much. But what we truly care about is what happens to the disparity measures. And what ends up happening for the disparity measures is that for the Asian demographic, we see the TPR disparities move closer towards one. So here, let's say for the full debiasing, it goes from 1.85 to 1.67, and then from 0.79 for fibrogranular to 0.809. The impact isn't as severe, but this is still a work in progress. 
So we expect with further fine tuning, we could get in a better, get closer to our end goal. And then we did the same experimental setup for the chest x-ray data set. But here we're only dealing with two, um, two race classes. So we're only dealing with African-American and white. And then for our disease prediction task, we're only dealing with four of the expert labels. So atelectasis, edema, no finding, pneumothorax, and just because it would, it would have been simpler to work around with. And here we see, we do not see as great of a result where the between fully debiased and partial debiased, there really isn't that much of a difference. Where in most, in some cases, actually the fully bias performs slightly better. But we do see some improvements in the case of no finding. But what we do see is uh, that the debiasing also here doesn't, there isn't really much change where we see pneumothorax get a score closer to one. And, but for other classes such as hackalatasis, the performance doesn't really improve overall. Uh, this wouldn't, and this would maybe perhaps suggest that we need a stronger, uh, some confounding variable besides perhaps race that to the bias on like let's say age or gender. But we, we've been working on several other experiments to observe what might potentially be a way to improve this class's performance in general. And Can I ask a quick question here. Yeah, well, I'm uh, basically done, so yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, do you mind going through the previous slide? Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm not very understand incorrectly, mm -hmm. but I feel that the, mm -hmm. the baseline is already like pretty, is there, there isn't too much bias here for you to correct, right? Like the disparity scores are around one or like within the 80% rule. So maybe, mm -hmm. maybe like, yeah, I guess it, it, it's probably not because your model isn't working, but because this problem isn't that, um, yeah, yeah. Isn't, isn't really needed to be debiased. Uh, yes, in a way, yes, in this particular case, yeah, there wasn't a strong signal um, for this one in particular. Uh, we were still hoping that maybe there would be a, some slight improvement. But yes, you're correct. The bias in this one isn't that severe as in other cases. Okay, yeah. thanks. Is there any other questions? Um, I have another question. So I thought it was very cool that um, you had some idea about the um, the breast data set where you had some um, correlation between the breast density and the race. I was wondering if there are such known findings about chest X-rays that like uh, do you really expect to see bias um, like visibly in in terms of um, race and if if that's a variable that you can actually correct for. So there, uh, with one of the collaborators, um, there has been a discussion that there might be more correlations with um, regional, uh, let's say like access to, uh, I'm forgetting on the name right now, um, but basically let's say access to healthcare in different, like let's say by zip code can be uh, like a confounding variable. And let's say certain demographics, let's say have higher incidence of diabetes and other diseases. And they argue that those would be more of the biasing feature than, and basically pre-existing conditions mm -hmm. would be more influencing than just uh, race itself. I see. Yeah. And, and the data sets that you have for, um, mm -hmm. like not the chest X-ray, but, but the, um, um, MRE data sets, like are they from one single hospital or are they um, also from multi centers, which could also be a correlation that maybe that could be tied to the demographics? 
So the for Emory, it is multi-center. So it is from all the hospitals in, uh, in the Emory's network. So all the main ones are included. Yeah. I see. Oh, sorry, I, I still have one more question. Uh, just yeah, yeah. It's, it's still more a conceptual question. Um, so assuming that there are like multiple centers and you're getting data from um, multiple centers and one center is, is more biased towards like a certain demographic, then just because of that centers, let's say that the scanner they use is different from other scanners, like could, could those affect um, things apart from just like apart from race being a direct um, correlating factor, like it could be other things that that. Um... Yeah, so I we did try to look into this for the detecting race um, study. I'm not sure if that those particular results were included, uh, but at least I can say for scanners, there wasn't much of a difference. And then um, for by hospital, so within each hospital, we compared the disparities and mm -hmm. we also didn't come up with much of an answer there either. Got so there okay. didn't seem to be any effect by hospital. So Nancy, just to just to add to that, like, um, so ideally, like breast mammograms, they are like mm -hmm. two, um, like two very popular ways of acquiring that. Mm -hmm. One is through the G, and one is hologic, you know. These are the I two see. scanner type that most most like all over the US they mainly use these two scanner type, and they have a very standard protocol for acquiring mammogram. I see. So we actually did so all these twelve centers. Emory actually they are like alternatively use hologic and um, GE both. Mm -hmm. So we did the validation on the scanner type, just for these two, the hologic and GE. But yeah, so as Ramon mentioned, like we don't see any difference. I see. Yeah, I was I was kind of uh, hoping to see if there are some confounding factors that would prevent your like the, the biases from um, race coming up because but like maybe something to do with the different centers being uh, popular in, in certain aspects. Mm -hmm. Interesting to know. Thank you. All right. Is there any other question from the audience? All right, if not, let's thank you, Ramon, again for this uh, very uh, amazing talk. And yeah, just a reminder that uh, this is our last AI session this year, and we will take a long break from uh, next week onwards, and we will resume our sessions in early January. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank happy you. holidays. Bye-bye.